So, welcome everyone. Um, this is my panel called Layering Leitmotif, Expressing Narrative Through Musical Ideas. Uh, glad you all came out here, especially because I'm pretty sure most of you don't know who I am. Big risk you're taking. Come on in, why not? Uh, so, welcome, it's MAGFest 2020. Yeah, cheer it up. And it's also the new year, new decade. Love that. Uh, also, uh, don't judge me for my stock images too much. That's just my aesthetic, and I love them. Uh, but before we get this uh, show on the road, I just want you to tell me, how does this sound make you feel? <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Most of those are honest answers. <laughs> All right. How about this one? <laughs> A little tense, kind of scared. That makes sense? All right, and one more. <laughs> Fun, upbeat, and party music, and that is all correct, because there are no wrong answers. I know, right? You all get A's. <laughs> And the thing that links those all together is that they're all written, designed to make you feel a certain emotion. And that is just like leitmotif, which we're about to talk about right now. So, before I begin, I'm going to say stuff about myself. My name is Akil. Uh, I also sometimes post music under the name Turtwigex. And then I also, also sometimes post music under the name Cassidini. It depends on which day and how I feel. Uh, I went to UVA, for all of you that also did. Woo! Tech is cool too, don't worry. Uh, I write gay music. I, I also listen to it a lot. It's amazing. Uh, this is my first time ever hosting a panel, so I'm filled with that nervous energy. And also, I have a Twitter where I post music sometimes, and you can check that out if you don't hate this. So, our goal for today, we are going to be using leitmotif in composition that not only enhances the emotional attachment to the story, but also aids as a storytelling device. But, like, what's a leitmotif, really? And this is not a question, I'm gonna tell you even if you know. So, the first and most obvious definition is its literal translation. It's German for leading motive. Who speaks German? All right, can you tell me what that means? I didn't raise my hand. Oh no, someone behind you. Well, I can. <laughs> uh, so, Leading means that it takes you somewhere, and motive means a short, a recognizable piece of music. So it is a short phrase that leads you to something else, that being what it's representing, which is usually a person or an object. Now, the more academic definition is that it's a short, constantly recurring musical phrase uniquely associated with a particular person, place, object, or concept. And the good part about that is, it's basically like a musical pronoun. It represents a person, place, or thing. Now, for some clarifications, uh, the way I like to think about it is that it is less than a theme or a whole song, but more, or at least, a motif. So a motif is the shortest amount of music that can still hold recognizable information when you're talking about melody, that's about two notes. And a song is like 
a whole song, like a good three minute song or more. Also, it's usually mapped one to one, meaning one light motif per thing it's representing. It usually can't do one to two unless it is about two people who are closely related in a group or two people, or if the light motif itself evolves and changes. And it can't be two to one because one person can only have one. You can't be greedy. And the only exception to that is if there are two aspects to that person, like say they're Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, they can have two different musical associations. And they are most effective when they change throughout the narrative, but they don't always have to. Some people will say they do, but sometimes they don't. And most importantly, uh, most of this is my opinion because everything is basically opinion. It's my interpretation, it's my way, this is how I have learned it and how I practice it, and you do with it what you want, nothing is real, that's the truth. <laughs> So I'm going to play a few more examples since I assume you all like games. These are all going to be some sound effects which are basically light motifs for things that you touch in video games. So who knows what this is? <laughs> what is it? That's correct. All right, and how about this one, this is definitely going to be difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing you got that too. All right, final round. This is the hardest one I could think of, mostly because I've only played half of this game. Please don't kill me. Yeah. Correct. I still love that game, it's amazing. Better finish it, <laughs> I will, give me time. So all of those are examples of static leitmotif, that meaning that they don't change. The way that they sound is the way that they always sound, no matter where you are in the game. And on the other end, sometimes they do change, and that's when they are dynamic. So. This is taken from gameplay, so it might be a little difficult to hear, but still, can you tell me what this is? What game is that? That's correct. But do you know what it is in Super Mario Galaxy? That is exactly what that is. Amazing. Oh uh, yeah, it is the it is Super Mario Galaxy, and it's the question mark block panel that you step on, you turn it from blue to yellow, and it makes a note. It was like my favorite part of that game. <laughs> All right, round two. This is incredibly easy. So, what is this? So what was that? Yeah, Super Mario World and good friend Yoshi. Yes, Luigi, the red one. So last one, and this may or may not be hard unless you really enjoy this game. So what is that? It was Pokemon. Which one? It is black, not Diamond and Pearl. So what was the light motif in that instance? What was changing? Not the wall. Good, good guess though. Well, if you yes, exactly. It's when you move around and. There's like this marching accompaniment that joins you to like signify that you're on the move or moving forward. So, good game, good game. 
Now, uh, just to reiterate what these are, static means that it doesn't change, and if it does, it's very minimal. And if it, and when it does change, it doesn't usually change that much, and that's why it's static. But it's powerful because it leaves an impression. You know what a coin sounds like because it's a coin. It always sounds exactly the same unless it's a red coin or a blue coin. And the same goes for like the, uh, the, Zelda, the Zelda theme. And dynamic is different in that it's possible to be different based on an independent variable. So in the case of Yoshi, that is the level that you're on because the overworld Yoshi bongo accompaniment is different from the athletic bongo accompaniment and different from the underground one. And the thing that holds it together so you know that it is Yoshi is that it's always bound by what I call a leitmotivic identity, that being what it is. So in the case of Pokemon, that would be that it's always like a marching accompaniment. It's always snare drum, usually cymbals, and for some reason a whistle. I never marched with the whistle, but I don't know, some people do. <laughs> so on the topic of leitmotivic identity, uh, this is a non-exhaustive list of everything that I could find as being used as a type of leitmotif. So first up is melody, one of the most often seen things in Western music. It's basically the singable part. Do, 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 do. So that's really powerful because it's very flexible, very expressive, and you could simulate or represent pretty much anything with a good melody. And then next on that list, I have instruments or timbre. And instrument, that's obvious. It's like a clarinet or like a euphonium or something. And timbre is basically the unique sound of that instrument. And I put that there too because with modular synths and other things, you can basically create your own instruments. And it's really powerful. And next up I have there is rhythmic pattern. So that's basically music through time that doesn't necessarily have to have a pitch, but sometimes it does. And I think we all know what rhythm is. Uh, then we have harmony or a chord voicing. So that is a particular chord or a voicing of that chord, which is how the notes are arranged. So maybe something like E major 7 sharp 11 represents someone. Then you have genre like your rock, your pop, your metal, and or whatever the Trans-Siberian Orchestra is. <laughs> It's like, are, are they rock, are they orchestral, are they orchestral rock? I don't know. Then you have time signature. So you can do something easy like, say, three, four represents like a royal person. You could give them six, eight. You give them 15, 16. You can give them uh, 132. And if you're feeling really dangerous, you can even do four, four. If you feel, <laughs> that is if you feel like writing an entire game of music that does not have 4-4 except in one place. <laughs> but if you do, that's awesome. <laughs> and next is chord progression. So that's easy, you know, like a 2-5-1 or a 1-4-6-5. Usually something a little more interesting to represent different people. And then lastly, texture. And texture in that case, meaning something like planing chords, like planing augmented chords. Whenever you hear them in that motion, that represents one specific person. So now that we've gone through all that, what like isn't a leitmotif? And the answer is nothing, but also something. <laughs> Now, to reiterate, what I said was it's less than a whole song, but at least a motif. So if it were less than a motif, uh, then it would be like really hyper-specific, like one exact thing. 
and you wouldn't be able to dis distinguish it from anything similar to that. And on the other hand, if it's way too broad, then you just have this very vague thing that you can't tie down to any one specific person. So I also have some musical examples for this. Uh, these are, one of them is from a game, the other two aren't. Uh, if you can guess this, I'm sorry. Okay, what game is that from? Yes, I'm <laughs> Again, I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, so that is a leitmotif because it's a gun. <laughs> Why would a gun represent someone? It's a gun. Okay, here's this next one. This will probably be easy. Let's find out. All right, what's that instrument? More specific. More specific. It is a Steinway, but can we be even more specific? What year did it come out? This is a 1960 Steinway Model B grand piano. It's different from all other grand pianos in the way that I said it was. <laughs> You're laughing because you know that's not true and that's why this isn't leitmotif. And now for the last one, it's gonna be a combination of a few different examples. So let's see if you can guess what this one instrument is. Okay, what instrument is that? It's another company like Casio and Yamaha. It is a Roland, a Roland Aerophone. And you can't use that, obviously, because it sounded like three different instruments at once. I mean, chameleons are great, but not if you want to represent something specifically. So, going over this opinionated, also non-exhaustive list, uh, we have, first up, a single note name, F sharp. You can't give someone F sharp because unless you have perfect pitch, how does that sound different from F or A? And if you do have perfect pitch, uh, uh. <laughs> now for a specific instrument that is just like the 1960 Steinway, or let's say you have an, like a Stradivarius violin, some people can hear a difference between a Stradivarius and like the dollar store violin. Uh, I can sometimes, but usually not. Then you have key center, again, if you have perfect pitch, sure you could do that, but not everyone can tell when a song is in the exact key of G. Then you have tempo, so unless you are a robot or a conductor, you can't really tell what tempo a song is in at any given moment. But if you can, please be a conductor, please. <laughs> then you have a whole song, again, Developing music is too long for a short recurring phrase to be placed in between other pieces of music. Then you would just have the song that you listen to when you're sad. And that's good for some instances, but not when you use it for, when you want to use it for more than one person. And then I wrote down texture again because there are types of texture that are just too non-specific, like monophony. You can't say someone's leitmotif is the fact that they only play one instrument, and that's it. And then there are chord inversions, sometimes, because it can be hard to tell when the bass note is the root or the fifth, but a lot of people can, especially if you're a trained musician. I personally wouldn't do it, but it is possible. So that's why I said maybe. Now, 
we can move on to the next section where I talk about mapping leitmotifs to different things. So, as I said in the beginning, a leitmotif is basically a musical pronoun, which means we have to put it to a person, place, object, or a concept slash idea. And when you have these things in games like, say, Mario, let's go with Mario. So Mario comes out, and he has his theme song. And then from that theme song, you're going to derive the melody or the instrument, and that would be Mario's leitmotif in that instance. And if you want leitmotif that maps really well, then you want to make sure that the quality of the music matches the subject. So like in the beginning, when I played all that death music for you, if you want someone who is about to die or is morbidly obsessed with the dead, you would give them something that sounds like death. If you want someone who is happy all the time, you give them something that sounds happy. Gives, if you have someone that is like a very devout worshiper, then you would want to give them something like a church choir or a Hammond organ. Hammond organs are great, by the way. So now let's break down those categories. So with characters, they're especially important because they're the people, and people relate to people really well, even if those people are animals. In fact, sometimes more if they're animals. Animals are fantastic. So when you're doing this representation, you want to do it with emotion. You want to make sure that when you are mapping to a character, you're also simulating an emotional response for that character so that you care about them. And then another way you can use it, you can use it to show the differences between people. You can have either a leitmotif for a group set of people, like the royal family, or you could do very slight changes between different leitmotifs to show how these two characters are juxtaposed with one another, like if they're brothers and they hate each other. Then you can also, like I said, do it for a group or a village or any sort of grouping of people that are tied together and represented as that one unit rather than a bunch of separate people. So my example that everyone probably already knows is Zelda's lullaby, which represents Zelda. So it's sort of slow and fair because she's the princess, but it also has a lot of leaps because she's powerful, she has magic, and she can end you easily. So for places, places are very similar. These all are kind of very similar, but when you give a leitmotif to a place, you make it feel real and grounded, like as though it existed forever. And another way that you can use a leitmotif for a place, you can show how it changes across a story. So if you return to a location multiple times and it becomes increasingly dilapidated, then you would want to change the leitmotif, like change the melody or the instrument and make it sound like it's being beat up or destroyed or empty. Another way you can use it is so that your characters feel nostalgia for a place or longing. Like they've left home and they really want to go back and then they hear the sound of where they're from, their birthplace. <coughs> and it's another good way of eliciting that emotional response that you want to give. Because you really want your players or viewers, if you're doing it for film, you want them to care about the places that you make. And then another way you can use it is you can have cohesion across a gigantic world. So if you have a single recurring melody that appears throughout the entire game, basically you have something that ties you into the location you're at, which I have in the example as Dinosaur Land, which is from this game. Never 
don't trust YouTube videos. So this theme is especially good because it's very catchy, very memorable. Koji Kondo is a genius, and it's used in just about every single overworld level in the game. It's used in all the castles, the ghost houses, the overall, the athletic, the underground, underwater, wherever you are, you know that you're in dinosaur land. Is that a question? Yeah. Yes. How is this less than a theme? Would this be considered more generally a theme than the library? Well, great question. The question was, is this not necessarily a theme? How is it, how would this be a leitmotif? So, the leitmotif in this instance would be the melody of this song. This is the theme for the, ath not the athletic level, it's the theme for the overworld level. And the leitmotif in this song is the main melody. The main melody is a theme that gets brought back in different songs, which evolve differently. So let's say like the underwater theme, it's in 3-4, it's more like a waltz, and that's how you know that one, the melody's there, you're in dinosaur land, but you're in a different area, you're underwater because it's a different song. So that's how you differentiate between whole song and leitmotif. A leitmotif doesn't always have to be short, by the way. It can be really long, just not an entire song. That's too long. <laughs> Length matters. So now we go on to objects. So most obvious, sound effects for items. It's the coin. You know a coin is a coin because it's identified by those two notes. Those two notes are its leitmotif because that's all you need. Another way you can use leitmotif for different items is you can make it feel like it's a part of the world or the level that you're in. So like the question mark panels in Super Mario Galaxy, those tie in very well to the level because they harmonize with the theme music. So that was Dreadnought Galaxy. And the theme for that, you know, it goes like, I'm gonna sing this, I'm sorry. Do, 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 do. And then the flip panels would play a note that resonates really well with that. So when it does that, and the instrument that is played for it, which I think is like a marimba or something, I don't know but it doesn't matter. The instrument that's played for it is always consistent. The notes always change based on the chord. And then another way you can use it is so that you can make some item stand out more than another one. So if you have like one basic sound effect for picking up a regular item and a different sound effect for picking up a very special important item, then you'd wanna use that sound to signify that you're picking up something that is unique and worthy of your attention. So lastly, we have the concepts. Concepts are basically for anything that's not physical or real. So you can touch people with their consent, you can touch objects, you can touch places, but you can't touch magic. So by giving magic its own theme, you're then making magic more real. You're bringing it into the world and you're making it so that you can have that emotional response to it. <clears throat> Another way that you can give uh, a leitmotif to an idea is you use it for foreshadowing. So foreshadowing in that case, meaning if you want to show something is potentially dangerous, you would have a theme for evil or danger or bad, and then you'd pepper it into whatever you're trying to say should be avoided. You want it to be subtle. That's how, it's, that's how it really gets you. It's gotta be subtle. So again, you would wanna use it for very fantasy subjects like magic or invasion or elves. Probably not elves, elves are people. <laughs> But something like that, that doesn't exist. Something that you can't touch. And then another good way you could use it is for a political alliance. If you wanna do good versus evil, you give, you give the good side a nice 
heroic theme, and you give the bad side a slightly less than heroic theme, but still good, because you want to be able to listen to it, like it's a song. So a good, uh, well, one of my favorite examples for this is the Mother 3 love theme, because it represents, uh, well, spoiler alert, if you haven't played it, and if you haven't, um, I don't know, leave and please do, but come back in the next five seconds. <laughs> so the mother of Lucas and Klaus, uh, her name is Hanawa, and her love for her children and their love for their family is all tied together in this one theme. So that melody comes back on and on throughout the game to represent when you're, well, mostly to feel sad, because it's kind of sad, but also to show that this is a touching moment about family and being connected to the people you love. And also, I just noticed I skipped something, because I forgot to talk about what Repulsion Gel is. Who's played Portal 2? Awesome. So that's where that comes from. And the repulsion gel and also the propulsion gel, they have their own sort of little instruments that come in and out whenever you're interacting with them. So for the repulsion gel, it's something that when you jump on it, you bounce really high. So whenever you're bouncing on it, these instrumental uh, flares come up. And let's listen to that. Here it goes. So those little trills, the doo, doo 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 I can't sing that. They show up every time you're bouncing on the gel. And you notice that they are different every time because it's dynamic. It's dynamic music. And every time it comes in, that's how you know that you are still bouncing on the, on the repulsion gel. So now that I made note of that, let's actually layer some light motif the title of this panel. So when you're layering, to reiterate once more, when you have a subject, like a person, place, thing, whatever, let's call them subject, then they're represented with a theme. From that theme, you draw out their leitmotivic identity. Either they're the instrument that plays in that theme, or they're the melody of that theme, or there is a chord in there that represents them. and then. You use that to make their leitmotif when you pepper it out throughout the narrative in different songs. Every time they show up, they're represented by that, by that piece of music. Then you can combine these different leitmotivic identities for different subjects. You can combine two people, a, pe a person in a place, an object and a concept. And when you put their leitmotifs next to each other, you're narratively linking them together. So by putting Johnny's theme next to a baseball bat's theme, you're saying that he either has the baseball bat, he likes the baseball bat, or he's going to do something very unsavory with a baseball bat. <laughs> and some ways that you can use the layering technique, you can either do it vertically, meaning that it happens at the same time. So if you have two, two different melodies, that would be like counterpoint. And that is point against point. It just means two melodies at the same time, unless you're doing it the Baroque way, in which case it's very complicated and I can't explain it. Then you have horizontal, meaning it's one right after the other in sequence. So you have like a sick sax solo followed by a sick piano solo. Maybe there are two people who are trying to compete with each other, or it's just a sick sax solo. And then the last technique is you can blend them together and make them into one thing. So an example of that is, to go back to the saxophone, you have, let's say, Richard, whoever that is, is the saxophone. And then you have Molly as a chord progression. 
So then if you have the saxophone playing that chord progression, their light motifs blend together to become one. So now both of them are represented by this one thing. And that's a really cool way of using it. Uh, so now here's an audio example of something that I wrote for this specifically. So scenario and spoiler alert for uh, basically every JRPG ever. <laughs> There is someone, uh, and she needs a name, so I decided to call her Lorelai, because that's a cool name. Uh, someone you'd been traveling with throughout the whole game turns out to be the leader of the opposing forces. They have the mystic doomsday MacGuffin device at the top of the ancient super special tower that the evil team has taken over. Yeah, very, very basic concept. So. You'll note that I have a bunch of things over there underlined, and those are all different nouns that I used. And each one of those nouns are important enough that I decided to give them their own leitmotif uh, as thus. So I divided them into different categories of the different nouns, so person, place, object, and concept. Uh, I tried to use all of the identities that I wrote down, but I couldn't figure out how to use a time signature, but I swear it works, please trust me. <laughs> so for person, we have Lorelei, gave her a melody, because she's worth it. Uh, for evil team, I gave them a genre, and you'll be hearing that in a moment. Team leader, I gave the team leader, who is a mystery at the beginning. I gave them a mysterious sounding chord. Then for a place, you're at the ancient tower, that has a chord progression. For object, the mystical MacGuffin thing that uh, does a thing, that has its own instrument. Then for concept, uh, we have Doomsday, the end of the world, which is obviously a rhythm. So, let's layer this thing. I'm gonna transition. How do I open this? Can I do this? I can't do that. <laughs> there we go. So, this is Family Tracker. I like 8 bit music. Who does? Who likes 8 bit music? Yeah. Awesome. You're great people. So, this is the full theme of what I'm about to show you, but first, Let's go into what these are supposed to be. So for the evil team, like I said, they're represented by a genre. And I decided to give them the genre of metal, because why not? All right, remember that. And yes, it is metal. Chiptune can be metal. It can be anything. <laughs> So next we have the Ancient Tower. The Ancient Tower has its own chord progression and it goes like this once I turn it on. Very calming. Very ancient, maybe. Next, you have my girl, Lorelei. Powerful, as always. She gets her own melody, and because she wants you to trust her at first, uh, instead of being in minor, we put in something very easy and palatable, like major. It, minor's also cool, too. I'm, I, don't, I don't dislike minor, it's awesome. So that would be the primary leitmotif that forms her entire theme. Then for the mysterious team leader, whoever that may be, they get this very spooky sounding chord. Mysterious. <laughs> then for the representation that the world's gonna end, we have a rhythm that sounds a little something like this. F 
funky. It's a dance party at the end of the world. <laughs> and lastly, but not leastly, we have the sound of the mystical, magical item that does a thing. And for that, I decided to represent it with, as best as I could do with the Famicom disc system, a church bell. So now that you heard all those, let's actually put it all together. So the scenario goes that you are entering this tower. You have no idea what's going on. But all you know is that when you go in, you hear this at first. So if you can hear that it's obviously the metal thing, so the evil team that is at this location, let's call them Team Lamp. Team Lamp is at this uh, ancient tower because if you can hear it, the progression that's being used for this is the same one that is representing the ancient tower. Just represent it mostly with power chords as metal. So as you get further along in this tower, then you hear a second piece of music that comes in, uh, one that I'm about to turn on. And that's how you know that Lorelai is there. And because the chord also activates, that's how you know it's her who is the team leader. in minor because she's evil. Okay, so now you're nearing you're nearing the top of the tower. You've realized that your bestie is actually out to get you, but you don't know why that is until you hear this next part that comes in. the mystical item that is the instrument that represents the mystical item, also represented with the doomsday rhythm that little triplet had. So that's how you know the mystical item is being used to end the world. That Lorelei is the one who's using it, that she's the leader of the evil team who is there at this tower. And all of that is represented in this one piece of music. together, that's essentially what Larry Lightmotif is all about. <laughs> all right. So now, are there any questions? Yes, you. In a typical, typical game, how many Lightmotifs do you usually see Larry together? Okay, so the question was, in a typical game, how many leitmotifs do you see layered together? So, I would say, uh, in the games that I have studied, it's usually melody and instrument at the same time. It's usually not too hectic that you can't really parse out how many different leitmotifs are in it, but there's truly no limit to what you can do. If you want to throw in a bunch of melodies at once, Go right ahead, but mm -hmm. I'd say a reasonable max would be about like three or four. Also my opinion, it's not a fact. Do whatever you want. Yes, you. Um, I'm a huge Sonic fan. Right? Yes. That all the songs are all unique and they're pretty much 
probably isn't any like Matisse or Matisse that I know of, except the coin, except the ring, you know, sound. The ring is iconic. Um, so the question was, in Sonic, which is a good game franchise, there is basically, depending on the game, no leitmotif throughout the entire soundtrack. All of the songs are unique. Why? So for that, I'd say, well, for the, to speak to like the first two or three games, uh, because they were composed with the idea that each song should just sound really cool, Leitmotif isn't a technique that you necessarily have to use. Also, Sonic the Hedgehog doesn't really have a story. It's got a manual with a story in it, but really, really. Then when you get to things like Sonic Adventure, there are some recurring themes, but for the most part, it's, you know, rock songs for Rouge the Bat. It's like, whatever you call that genre, uh, it's, it's, uh, sexy heist music. <laughs> And then for Knuckles, you have rap, which, you know, I guess you could call that genre his leitmotif. But there's also the live and learn theme, which comes back every now and then. It happens sometimes in cutscenes, and it represents that game wherever they are, that world. But it's the thing that ties the whole experience together. So sometimes they have it, sometimes they just want to sound cool. And that's okay. It's okay to sound cool, because Sonic is cool. All right. Yes. Would you say that through time, uh, the ability of the general audience to understand different types of leitmotifs has changed? Like in today's world, I would say that you know melody is taking kind of a back story to more tambourine based changes. Would you say that that's will it change and has it changed? Okay. So the question was, through time, has the idea of what leitmotif is changed. Like, it used to be melody primarily a long time ago, and now it's more timbral. And has it changed, and will it change? Uh, my answer, yes, it has changed a lot, and yes, it's a very good thing. So, um, a quick brief history. Uh, leitmotif was uh, essentially coined by Richard Wagner. He wrote a lot of operas, and they were very long, and uh, He's dead now, so he does a control light motif. <laughs> now in things like Steven Universe, which is one of my personal favorite cartoons, you do have melodic themes, but you also have each character represented by a different instrument, like Pearl, she's the piano, Rose Quartz is the string section, uh, Amethyst is a drum machine. So you can have different ways of representing light motifs rather than just melody. Things are going to change as we become more sensitive to other kinds of music and we stop leaning so heavily on Western music, which is really melody, melodically focused. And I, I'm all for it. I, I think it should change even more. There should be songs with no melody at all. So why not? All right. You over there. Um, also, if you want to form a line, that would be cool too, if you want. It's a choice. So the examples you gave were primarily narratively based uh, in games. Are there any examples you can think of that are mechanically based? Not to draw a firm distinction between the two, but just I'm interested in that. Make, uh, well, the question was, the leitmotifs that I talked about were primarily narratively based, and are there that are mechanically based? In counter question, do you mean one that just represents a mechanic in a video game? Uh, yes. Well, for that, I would point to the example of the Super Mario Galaxy flip panel thing. That has absolutely nothing to do with the story. The story of Rosalina looking for her mom and not finding her, or the story of Mario trying to find Peach. It's just a flip panel, and that, that is what it is, but it has its own sound because it's special and important. So, <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> you. Uh, did you have to have any recommendations for programs that beginner musicians can use to start making music for their games? Yes, I do. Oh, question. 
The question was, are there any beginner music programs that I can recommend for people trying to get into writing game music? And counter question, what kind of game music do you like? Because there's chiptune, there's like sample stuff. That's almost pretty much it, unless you are rich enough to have an orchestra. But, well, um, I guess anything you can recommend. Well, I super definitely recommend Family Tracker. It's amazing. I've used it for, what is it, 2020? Like eight years. Um, I've never gotten tired of it. I'm a huge fan. Um, another one I've been teaching myself is Open MPT. It's another tracker because I'm very fond of trackers. They're pretty easy to understand. It's a column and there are notes and that's it. And some other stuff, but that's it. You're welcome. Also, if you're into digital audio workstations, which is just like recording stuff, I would recommend Reaper. It's mostly free. All right, other questions? You. Can you go back uh, a slide to the character like, right now? Uh, yes. Uh, where is the button? Okay. Bye. Bye. Wait, uh, the character association slide? One more? More, more. That one? Yeah, the going left, go right. Oh, go right? Yeah. one before the final slide. Yeah. One more. That one. Okay, great. Ooh, that was hard. <laughs> All right, uh, any more questions? Yes. Uh, in games themselves, uh, you've seen like the way like motif has changed based off of like what was technically available, like in retro games versus like modern games. Yes, the question was, have I seen how light motif has evolved in games specifically with the evolving technology? So, for that, I'd say, in 8-bit, you've got like three or four different waves you can use in today's music. There is basically an infinite amount of instruments you can use, so there's definitely a heavier emphasis on instrumental leitmotif. Even in the jump from 8-bit to 16-bit, Yoshi was represented by bongos or other Latin percussion. You couldn't necessarily do that on the NES unless you loaded in a bunch of samples to the sample channel, and that's very memory intensive, and that just wouldn't have worked. So. As things go on and music is easier to use in video games, I'd say it definitely shifts away from just leaning on melody so much, which again is a good thing. Less Western music. Any more questions? Yes. Um, on the top of the paper tracker thing, broke there is uh, uh, apparently a, God, I can't think, um, uh, to, like one on one course in the maker face tonight. Uh, that I saw the schedule, um, and when my question is uh, with the propulsion gel thing, the the the, uh, the speed of gel whose name I now can't remember, but it had like a warm, more warmer, like buzzing core or instrument, right? That right. That played when you were speeding on. So I'm wondering about like uh, like most you say these sort of juxtapose against each other, um, and like like what strategies there are for that kind of thing. Uh, so. Uh, was your question like relating to Family Tracker? Uh, it, was like, like the, it was about the propulsion gel, the, the speed of gel. Like how you can juxtapose those two? Yeah, like, like juxtaposing like, like, like what he's like, how you said good and evil can have different things and such. Ah, so the question is how can I juxtapose two different light motifs to show that they're supposed to be opposites from each other? Like how you have good versus evil, how would you show? Uh, Repulsion gel versus what I think is called propulsion gel. I don't know. I played it like lots of years ago. Um, I'd say the way to do that is you make them musically opposite. And that makes no inherent sense because it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> if you have a melody, if it goes up, you make the opposite go down. If the instrument is a wind instrument, you make it like a string instrument, not to say string instruments are wind opposites, but you, just, you basically want to take the qualities of one theme and invert it so that it's different. 
but you all want to make it still similar so that you know the two are connected somehow. All right, are there any more questions? Yes. Uh, sure thing. Let me see if I can go back that far. Oh, oops. There we go. You're welcome. Those are my aliases. That's the question. Any other other questions? No. Well, uh, what? One question there. Have you seen uh, Family Studio? It's like a family tracker that's. Presented more like a traditional dog, so it has like the timeline and stuff. But it's, I think it uses the same guts. I don't know if you're aware. You said that's Family Studio. Studio is what's called. I'm writing that down. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. Are there any? Yes. This is completely random. But I love random. On um, Town of Salem, I think we've played a bunch of games together a while back. You know, I do have a Town of Salem account. That's most likely me. Uh, it depends on how many years ago that was, because I remember I played it one year because my roommate in college forced me to play it. And then I got really busy with work and procrastinating work, so I didn't play it that much after that. But probably, I'm, I'm usually Turtwig X on anywhere you will find a Turtwig X, unless someone stole it before I got there. <laughs> All right. Any last questions people have? This is your only chance to ask it. Yes. When will you be releasing the Lorelei game? <laughs> <laughs> um, Lorelei 2021 will be released on all platforms that you can think of: PC, Nintendo Switch, and the others that are going to exist. <laughs> uh, PS Rectangle and X Trash Can. Uh, the Kickstarter goal is negative one dollars. If you'd like to pledge, please do. We need it. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so I believe that's it. I have a final slide that just basically says goodbye. <laughs> goodbye. Thank you all for coming.